Okay, go for it. Okay, welcome back folks and welcome to Comfish 2022. Really great to be here in person. And I'm gonna start off by thanking our Comfish sponsors, Highmark Marine Fabrication and North Rim Bank. We really appreciate the support to put this on. Um, this year, our, our forums are hybrid. So there's an opportunity for folks to be listening online. Um, for those online, you can um, put your questions in the, the Q&A chat, Q&A box. And at the end of um, the presentation, we'll have some time for um, questions and answers. So um, thanks again. Really great to be here gathering in person. So next up, we have um, Mike Litzel. He is going to talk about how climate change is affecting fisheries now. Mike Litzel is the director of the NOAA Fisheries Lab. He's a fisheries biologist who has studied climate impacts on Alaska's marine ecosystems for the last 25 years. So we're really glad to hear, have you here in the room with us, Mike, and thanks. And let's give, give Mike a round of applause. Thanks, Teresa. And uh, thanks to everyone who stuck around. Um, so there are two ideas that motivate this talk today. The first idea is that we're at a really interesting point in history where for decades, people in my world have been, have been saying to each other, when's it gonna happen? When are we gonna see the signal of global warming um, becoming apparent in Alaskan ecosystems? When are we gonna see that signal becoming unmistakable against the background variability that we're used to? And the answer to that question we now know is 2014. It happened in 2014 and since then, we Alaskan ecosystems have been in a state that we can only explain through human changes to the climate. Then the second big question or big idea is that given that we're, we're in this new state, there's an opportunity where if we can start to recognize and understand the consequences of global warming that are emerging for our fisheries, that gives us an opportunity to, um, to sort of, um, it gives us a, how to put it, a platform for, for responding, for planning, for adapting for climate change now and going forward. So next slide, please. Okay, so to begin the talk, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna step back from Alaska and I'm gonna sort of shamelessly pluck this idea um, from a talk I saw from Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, who's a, a climate scientist at the University of Texas, and she's a really great climate communicator. And so here's, here's the premise that she puts forward. Um, and this, the idea comes from data on polling on public perceptions of climate change across the United States that's organized and posted by the Yale uh, Climate Communications Program. And the first question that, that's asked in this, uh, in this survey in 2021, is global warming is happening, yes or no? And the headline result here is sort of this story of like, you know, is there, is there a public debate about whether or not climate change is happening or not? That, that debate is over. You know, large majority of Americans recognize that global warming is happening. Um, and that's true in Kodiak as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> then in the next question in the poll, will global warming harm future generations? Again, strong consensus across, um, across the sort of all of, or most of America, <clears throat> recognizing that global warming will be a problem for future generations. But next slide, please. This is the disconnect that Dr. Heho points to. When you ask people, is global warming gonna affect you personally? Then you see this big ramp down in the positive response rate. And that's true for Kodiak too. We go from like 74% for those other questions to 50% for Kodiak. The idea that Catherine Hayhoe puts forward is that this um, disconnect between recognizing the problem and recognizing whether it's going to affect us personally has to do with how climate change has been discussed in the past. We tend to discuss it as a distant problem. It has to do with polar bears. It has to do with Australian bushfires. It doesn't have to do with our home range, or it has to do with a distant time. It's going to affect our children, our grandchildren. It's not necessarily going to affect us. But if it is affecting us and we don't recognize it, that creates a vulnerability in our ability to respond. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so now I'll sort of come back to Alaska. And, and the first point I wanna make about Alaska and Alaskan ecosystems now is how unmistakable the warming pattern is. And so I'll start illustrating that with these sea surface temperature data. So this is just average sea surface temperature data for the Bering Sea and the Gulf of Alaska for every month, uh, January, February, March, April, all the way down through December, 
for every year from 1950 through 2021. So each block is one month in one year. And the data have been plotted as the difference from the monthly mean. So, so the row going across from May all the way there is, was that particular May colder or warmer than the average of all Mays for that whole 1950 to 1921 time series? So you can see, we start off cold in the Bering Sea, both the Bering and the Gulf go through cold and warm periods. And then from 2014 on, we get to something totally new that we haven't seen before, where the magnitude of warming and the persistence of warming is really uh, unique in the time series. Next slide. And that magnitude of warming becomes especially apparent if you just average the data across a whole year. You know, what's our average sea surface temperature for a whole calendar year for the Bering or for the Gulf? And you can see beginning in 2014, uh, 2015, and then especially in 2016, 2019, 2020, we've hit temperatures that are at or beyond the maximum that we've ever seen before. Good timing, thanks. Um, and so we see this sort of, um, you know, unprecedented warming. And then there are immediate consequences for other physical behavior of the ecosystem. And the most obvious example of that is Bering Sea ice cover. So the Bering Sea is so incredibly rich for us because it's a shallow, broad continental shelf that's covered seasonally by ice. It's this Arctic ecosystem that's driven by that seasonal ice cover. We had, you know, what we sort of thought was a big range of variability in ice um, before this warming event happened. And the interesting thing about this time series is that sort of I've been around in the field long enough to remember that the oceanographers, as we got more and more interested in, in global warming effects, oceanographers were really firm in their opinion that the Northern Bering Sea would stay ice covered in the winter for our lifetimes, like for the rest of this century, just because it's so far North, there's so little sunlight in the winter, it's always gonna be ice covered. And turned out that lasted until 2018. March of 2018, the entire Bering Sea was ice free. Um, and it's really something we didn't think we could see. So, so the warming happens, it takes us you know, to this completely new state with something like ice cover that we know is very important for fisheries like snow crab, uh, which I'll get to in a minute. But then the other thing I wanna say about this time series is how we understand it. Like for a long time, when we've had some really outsized climate or weather event, something like you know, bushfires in Australia or drought um, you know, somewhere in the lower 48 or a, a European heat wave, it's natural for people to, to ask, is this climate change? Is this global warming? And for the longest time, the climate science community had a really um, firm answer, answer, which was, we can't tell you about an individual event. We know there's a trend, we know we're causing the trend, but an individual year, an individual event, we don't know if that was caused by people or not. That answer has changed. Um, there's been this rapid development in a field called attribution science. So it's sort of a subfield in climate science where people uh, take models, climate models, run under pre-industrial conditions. So without the changes we've made to the atmosphere and then run those same models under the current conditions with the changes we have made to the atmosphere and look at the incidence of events. How often does a particular event happen in those two cases? And that can uh, give you inference, give you information about the, the human cause between, behind a particular event. So next slide, please. And people have started running those attribution studies for our ecosystems. So um, the really outsized warming for Alaska began with the blot. Um, and I happen to know Nick Bond professionally. He's the oceanographer from, and climate scientist from, uh, from Washington who came up with the name The Blob and he's always regretted it. And he says, you know, he wish he hadn't because it just kind of got run away with um, in the popular imagination. But anyway, for good or ill, we know 2013 through 2015 as The Blob years. This paper came out in Science a couple of years ago where um, these authors ran an attribution study for The Blob. And their conclusions were that in the pre-industrial ocean, before human changes to the atmosphere, you'd expect to see a marine heat wave this big, this warm, and this persistent less than once every 10,000 years. They also concluded that in the 2020s, in our climate now, we should expect an, an event like this on average every 30 years. By the 2040s, it's on average every decade we get one of these. 
So it's this clear indication of the human, human causality behind this event, where without human changes to the climate, our understanding is that none of us would ever see something like the blob. And now it's becoming you know, more and more likely as time goes on. Thanks. And people have been running similar um, attribution studies focused right on our systems, on the Gulf and on the Barren and on these annual sea surface temperature events. So there's a number of these that have been published with sort of the last generation of climate models. There's some studies that I'm involved in that are working on the same question with the newest generation of climate models. The answer depends on which, which generation of climate models you, you are using. But the answer sort of varies for 2016 and 2019 in particular, those really warm years. Either we believe that those temperatures were impossible in the pre-industrial ocean, or there's something like 21 to 39 times more likely now than they were in the pre-industrial ocean. So sort of in our link or our chain of causality, we, we recognize that there's this very outsized warming happening in Alaska. And now we know it's, it's climate change, it's us, it's human caused climate change. It's not anything that we'd expect to see in the pre-industrial ocean. So then the question becomes, what are the effects on fisheries from these events? Next slide, please. <clears throat> so I always like to say, like if I'm ever, you know, pre-COVID every now and then I'd find myself professionally like drinking beers with climate scientists. And it's always fun to remind them how simple their science actually is because it's based on physics and you can, you know, gin up predictive models and run them a bunch of times. But ecosystems and fisheries, that's hard. That's really complex. And so um, it's famously difficult to make inferences about what causes a particular population to go up or down. You know, we're, we're always limited. We can't run experiments. We have to just watch the, watch the system unspool over time and try to make inferences. But in Alaska, we're a lot better off than most places because we operate in a really data-rich situation. We've had really good rigorous fishery science, science up here for decades. And so um, when something like the Gulf Cod collapse comes along, we've got really good data for understanding the situation. So Gulf Cod, you know, the biomass was really high in the late 80s um, and has been declining. But in 2014, it was, it was at a good level, 100,000 pounds of female spawning biomass was the estimate. Um, and all the indications, we had strong cohorts coming into the, to the population, we expected it to go up. After that warming event, it collapsed, of course, no surprise to anyone in this room, and it resulted in closure of the, the federal fishery. We've got sort of the best um, level of understanding, best level of data support that we'll really ever have for a fishery, that that collapse was driven directly by the warming event that, that we caused. Um, next slide, please. Sockeye salmon are a really interesting one. <laughs> Bristol Bay is like the booming success story of Alaskan fisheries right now. And I don't have expertise in that fishery in particular. Um, the little bit I know um, sort of suggests to me that it's a real global warming winner at this point. We're seeing big population changes, big changes in the age that fish are going into saltwater, big changes in the age and size which they're returning. Those seem to be climate related and they're definitely related to booming productivity. In the Gulf, it's a different story, right? We know from, from fairly good data sets on um, ocean occurrence surveys, we know what the maximum preferred temperatures are for sockeye. And we know that Gulf temperatures are not beyond that, but are approaching those maximum preferred habitat levels for sockeye. And then we can look at things like total catch in the Gulf of Alaska. So on the, the vertical axis here, we're just plotting total catch as an anomaly, just because the math gets easier if you call average zero. If you call a bad year negative, you call a good year positive, all your math gets easier. So we do that over and over. Um, so you plot that catch outcome against a temperature outcome. Zero is average, negative is cold, positive is warm. When we've gotten these really extreme warm temperatures, we're starting to see some really bad outcomes for relatively, yeah, pretty, you know, you don't want to be like overblow it, but pretty bad outcomes, like lowest catches since the seventies in recent years for Gulf of Alaska sockeye. Uh, next slide, please. Bering Sea Pollock, right? So like when we think about big Alaskan fisheries, it's the biggest, um, biggest food fishery in the world. Um, 
a similar sort of plot here. Here I'm plotting, uh, or we're plotting um, weight anomalies. So for a given age, is, it, is a fish heavier than average or lighter than average against just pure temperature, spring and summer sea surface temperature for the Bering Sea. For the older fish that are important to the fishery and are really important reproductively in the stock, when you get to temperatures above four degrees, above five degrees, you get these really small fish. It has big implications for the fishery. We've seen similar, um, similar situations playing out here in the Gulf. After 14, we had, and after 16, we had really, really small fish some years. Um, here in the Gulf, we also, um, we didn't get anything like a collapse, but we got down to one age class. We had a real pop, um, an age structure collapse in the, in the population following the, the onset of those warming years. Um, and then one more slide, please, in terms of um, sort of an effect of warming on fisheries. Um, and this is um, sort of the poster child in my world. I deal um, in my job with Bering Sea, um, Bering sea crab along with Ben and, and, and colleagues at the Department of Fish and Game. And, and Ben spoke to the, the decline in, in um, snow crab uh, abundance. <clears throat> much more um, in a much more detailed way in a much more sort of elegant or refined way than I will. And, and understanding those particular mechanisms, you know, was it cod fish that were released into the snow crab range because of warming? Was it increased temperature or increased disease because of warming temperatures? Those questions are critically important for proper stewardship of the resource. You really have to understand what's driving the change. But what I'd suggest to you here is we could also just sort of step back and take the 50,000 foot level view. Um, we've been surveying, we, um, you know, people in my organization have been surveying uh, snow crab in the Bering for decades. And we've been fishing for snow crab in the Bering for decades. And we know that you don't find juvenile snow crab in any appreciable number above two degrees C. Um, that, you know, they're cold water Arctic animals. They live in areas that are covered by, by ice in the winter. Those temperatures of two degrees and colder are in these plots of Bering Sea um, summer bottom temperature from our trawl survey. They're the two darkest colors. So typically in the traditional Bering Sea, you get this cold pool of bottom water, say in 2010 and 2017, that cold water extends right through the core of the snow crab distribution all the way down to Bristol Bay in the Alaska Peninsula in 2019 and 2021. Those cold temperatures were way up north, north of St. Matt, all around St. Lawrence Island. So that area that's the core area of snow crab um, didn't see those cold waters that are, for whatever reason, seem to be required habitat uh, for snow crab. And coincident with that, we saw a 99% decline in survey abundance estimates for immature female snow crab and 96% decline in uh, abundance estimates for uh, immature male crab. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, oh you're giving it away. There we go. All right, <laughs> uh, no worries, all right. Um, so this is where I say, like, how do I put it? Um, there's a lot to be, uh, I think, really thankful for and where we're standing right now in terms of fisheries and climate in Alaska. And those past examples were not meant to be doom and gloom. And I think one of the real take homes is how much resilience we've seen and how well our fisheries are performing even during this outlandish warming event. But what I think these negative consequences that are starting to appear do suggest is the need for us to sort of recalibrate how we evaluate risk in the ecosystem, risk in these, um, in these fisheries that support us all. And the idea comes from this great paper that Andrew Pershing and colleagues published a few years ago in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And they pointed out that traditionally in all sorts of different um, human societies, we evaluate the risk of some event, the risk of a blizzard, the risk of a drought, the risk of a crop failure in terms of our past experience. It totally makes sense. You, you, your lived experience, your parents' lived experience gives you the range of possibilities and you use that to estimate your risk going forward. That works until you have a system that's changing rapidly. And then that historical knowledge and understanding becomes actually a barrier to adaptation and to, to changing in a, in a positive way. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll bring that idea back to Alaska with this plot. We try to illustrate this idea with Gulf cod. So here on the, 
The vertical axis, we've got year class strength, zero's average, positive's good, negative's bad, 1977 through um, 2019, I think is the last year. On most of that, that cloud, you see the variability that, you know, there's like life in a fishing town. There are some good years, there are some bad years. There's a lot of variability. But then we're plotting that on the bottom axis, axis against how much influence the climate models show us having on the ecosystem. The proportion of risk for a given warming event that we can assign to people, one means you've got something that's 100% human associated. You can't get that warm without people. We've only had four of those years that we've observed, but all four were very poor recruitment years, production years for Gulf Cod. So it suggested that past historical variability is potentially no longer relevant for understanding how that population is behaving. Next slide, please. And we, we continue with this idea with both Gulf Cod and Gulf Pollock, looking at historical variability of climate and year class strength from the 1970s through 2019. And those dots are sort of what you would get on average compared with what we expect given our climate in the 2020s and the, excuse me, the climate uh, year class strength relationship. And so that analysis suggests a decline of 38% uh, in expected year class strength for COD and 88% decline in expected average year, year strength for, uh, for Pollock in our current climate compared with previous decades. Next slide, please. Okay, I should hurry up because I'm going a little over, but I just want to come back to the causes. Um, you know, how are we getting here? Um, when we say human activities, there's a lot of them that are, that are influential on climate. Of course, overwhelmingly, it's carbon dioxide emissions. Um, there's this wonderful time series going back to 1956 at Mauna Loa, uh, tracking atmospheric carbon dioxide. We've gone from 315 parts per million to 415 parts per million. Next slide, please. The wild thing is when you lay that over a time series from our Antarctic ice cores, you can drill down in Antarctica and you can recover minute bubbles of ancient atmosphere and you can measure the carbon dioxide in that air going back 800,000 years. And so you get that time series and that's what natural variability looks like. And then all the way on the right is the Mauna Loa time series of what we've done over the past, you know, since 1956. So you can see that we've um, taken the, the you know, ap atmospheric carbon far beyond natural variability. We know that carbon dioxide is a heat, treeping, heat trapping gas. And so you can't have that much carbon dioxide and have a stable um, atmosphere, stable climate, and have a stable, um, stable Alaskan ecosystems. So that's the, you know, the cautionary side of all that. The good side about understanding the cause is it gives us predictive skill. Because we know carbon dioxide causes the warming, we can predict the warming. And this is illustrated really well. This is a, a three generations ago of climate model outputs. Model runs from 2004, where they use data up to 2000. And then everything after 2000 is a prediction just based on um, projected atmospheric carbon increases and predicted the temperature rise. And that prediction's in the black line. And then this year, someone went back and took the actual temperature in the red line and laid it over the prediction and they nailed it. We have predictive skill with climate models. And next slide, please. And then that gets us back to another cautionary point, which is where we are now with prediction. Okay, so this is the latest and greatest um, generation of climate models. We've taken 23 different models um, from groups around the world and got an average predicted warming trajectory for the whole North Pacific from 1850 to 2100 in gold there. And then we've laid the actual observed temperature in green on top of that. So um, you can see, again, we seem to be predicting the evolution, the warming very well. And um, this, these models suggest that the warming we've seen so far is just the beginning. This is not at all the new normal. We should expect to exceed the warming we've seen very quickly. And on timescales that are relevant to individual fishing and fishery science um, uh, careers. But then the sort of the promise um, or the less cautionary note is that this is one scenario for emissions that goes into these models. It's the worst case unrestricted emissions scenario. That future isn't written. And we know that if the emission scenario isn't unrestricted, we'll get a more gradual warming trend and we'll get less volatility in our ecosystems. 
So I'm speaking as a no employee and that question of as to how much emissions will be regulated is a policy question that I'm agnostic as to, but there's the point I'd like to make is there's a strong scientific expectation that regulating emissions has a, a direct benefit in terms of stability for our ecosystems. And next slide, please. It's the last slide. And I'll just say thank you very much. And if I have time, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, anybody like to ask Mike some questions? Because I know a lot to absorb. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michael. You, you mentioned uh, Bristol Bay Sockeyes is kind of positioned favorably right now. Yeah. Can you talk about maybe some other fisheries or species that could benefit? I mean, stocks moving north into the Gulf, um, maybe some of the positive elements? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really great question. Um, and so I think like maybe three things to say about that. The first is my 15 year old who loves fishing. He's always like tuna, dad. We're going to get a tuna fishery. Um, but, you know, in a more serious light, um, there's a real thing about adaptation that you want to, when you have fisheries that are threatened, you want to try to keep them going as long as you can to allow new opportunities to develop. And we know there will be new opportunities. Sablefish is pointed to quite often as something that seems to be doing really well in the current um, environment. Um, there are Bristol Bay, um, Bristol Bay sockeye that are doing great. Cod and Pollock have been, you know, rich, they've been moving north for decades and we're at the sort of southern commercial limit right now. So those two look troublesome for us. And then the final answer to your question is that we have such poor predictive skill, you know, like we, it's hard to predict with ecosystems. So I think in general, more southern species coming up is a safe bet, but beyond that, it's hard to be specific. You showed us the slide with, um, you know, kind of a business as usual, yeah. high emission yeah. scenario. Are there also um, predictive components coming forward at temperature if we can significantly decrease our carbon emissions? So, so a, a lower, a low carbon <laughs> emission scenario? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, another great question. Thanks, Teresa. And, and there are. And, um, you know, if there was a little more time in the week, I was hoping to have that plotted out for the North Pacific for one of the more uh, strange scenarios. They're quite different um, as you get farther out in the time series. Carbon dioxide lasts in the atmosphere for a super long time. So we've definitely baked in decades of warming, no matter what we do. But um, a couple decades out, those scenarios really start to diverge. And, and we do have a big lever to slow, slow the warming down. Thank you. Darius? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mike, for the excellent presentation. I just wanted to ask if there is any indication with the newer science of any, at least any hope of a negative feedback loop, any types of negative feedback loops. So far, I've only heard of really positive ones. And then off of that, is there any new science on, on um, cloud behavior? Will more increased warmer lead to uh, a more positive feedback loop for warming or might there be some negative feedback loop in it or is that still all up in the air? Thanks. Yeah, no, thanks Darius. Those are really good questions. And, and this is usually I do it earlier in a talk about climate where I say I'm actually a fisheries biologist. And so I don't really have great knowledge about a lot of the, the climate details. Um, you're right, we hear about positive feedback loops a lot, you know, um, in terms of like uh, tundra methane or Antar Antarctic ice sheets or what have you, um, where there's, there's the potential for runaway. Um, and there, there must be sort of similar negative feedback loops that are, you know, potentially going to come into play, but I don't really know what they are. It, that gets beyond my, my expertise, but yeah, maybe clouds, I, d I don't know. Thank you.
There we go. 